Chapter 7 of Memoir of Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoir of Jane Austen by James Edward Austen Lee. Chapter 7 Seclusion from the Literary World. Notice from the Prince Regent. Correspondence with Mr. Clark. Suggestions to alter her style of writing. Jane Austen lived in entire seclusion from the literary world. Neither by correspondence nor by personal intercourse was she known to any contemporary authors. It is probable that she never was in company with any person whose talents or whose celebrity equaled her own, so that her powers never could have been sharpened by collision with superior intellects nor her imagination aided by their casual suggestions. Whatever she produced was a genuine homemade article. Even during the last two or three years of her life, when her works were rising in the estimation of the public, they did not enlarge the circle of her acquaintance. Few of her readers knew even her name, and none knew more of her than her name. I doubt whether it would be possible to mention any other author of note whose personal obscurity was so complete. I can think of none like her, but of many to contrast with her in that respect. Fanny Burney, afterwards Madame d'Arblay, was at an early age petted by Dr. Johnson, and introduced to the wits and scholars of the day at the tables of Mrs. Thrale and Sir Joshua Reynolds. Anna Silwood, in her self-constituted shrine at Lichfield, would have been miserable had she not trusted that the eyes of all lovers of poetry were devoutly fixed on her. Joanna Bailey and Maria Edgeworth were indeed far from courting publicity. They loved the privacy of their own families, one with their brother and sister in their Hampstead villa, the other in her more distant retreat in Ireland. But fame pursued them, and they were the favorite correspondents of Sir Walter Scott. Crabb, who was usually buried in a country parish, yet sometimes visited London, and dined at Holland House, and was received as a fellow poet by Campbell, Moore, and Rogers, and, on one memorable occasion, he was Scott's guest at Edinburgh, and gazed with wandering eyes on the incongruous pageantry with which George the Fourth was entertained in that city. Even those great writers, who hid themselves amongst lakes and mountains, associated with each other, and though little seen by the world was so much in its thoughts that a new term Lakers was coined to designate them. The chief part of Charlotte's Bronte's life was spent in a wild solitude, compared with which Stevenson and Chawton might be considered to be in the gay world, and yet she attained to personal distinction which never fell to Jane's lot. When she visited her kind publisher in London, literary men and women were invited purposely to meet her. Thackeray bestowed upon her the honor of his notice, and once, in Willis's rooms, she had to walk shy and trembling through an avenue of lords and ladies, drawn up for the purpose of gazing at the author of Jane Eyre. Miss Mitford, too, lived quietly in our village devoting her time and talents to the benefit of a father scarcely worthy of her, but she did not live there unknown. Her tragedies gave her a name in London. She numbered Milman and Talford amongst her correspondents, and her works were the passport to the society of many who would not otherwise have sought her. Hundreds admired Miss Mitford on account of her writings for one who ever connected the idea of Miss Austen with the press. A few years ago, a gentleman visiting Winchester Cathedral desired to be shown Miss Austen's grave. The verger, as he pointed it out, asked, Pray, sir, can you tell me whether there was anything particular about that lady? So many people want to know where she was buried. During her life, the ignorance of the verger was shared by most people. Few knew that there was anything particular about that lady. It was not till towards the close of her life, when the last of the works that she saw published was in the press, that she received the only mark of distinction ever bestowed upon her. 
and that was remarkable for the high quarter whence it emanated, rather than for any actual increase of fame that it conferred. It happened thus. In the autumn of 1815, she nursed her brother Henry through a dangerous fever and slow convalescence at his house in Hans Place. He was attended by one of the Prince Regent's physicians. All attempts to keep her name secret had at this time ceased, and though it had never appeared on a title page, all who cared to know might easily learn it, and the friendly physician was aware that his patient's nurse was the author of Pride and Prejudice. Accordingly, he informed her one day that the prince was a great admirer of her novels, that he read them often, and kept a set in every one of his residences, that he himself, therefore, had thought it right to inform his royal highness that Miss Austen was staying in London, and that the prince had desired Mr. Clark, the librarian of Carton House, to wait upon her. The next day Mr. Clark made his appearance, and invited her to Carlton House, saying that he had the prince's instructions to show her the library and other apartments, and to pay her every possible attention. The invitation was of course accepted, and during the visit to Carlton House, Mr. Clark declared himself commissioned to say that if Miss Austen had any other novel forthcoming, she was at liberty to dedicate it to the prince. Accordingly, such a dedication was immediately prefixed to Emma, which was at the time in the press. Mr. Clark was the brother of Dr. Clark, the traveller and mineralogist, whose life has been written by Bishop Otter. Jane found him not only a very courteous gentleman, but also a warm admirer of her talents, though it would be seen by his letters that he did not clearly apprehend the limits of her powers, or the proper field for their exercise. The following correspondence took place between them. Feeling some apprehension lest she should make a mistake in acting on the verbal permission which she had received from the prince, Jane addressed the following letter to Mr. Clark. November 15th, 1815 Sir, I must take the liberty of asking you a question. Among the many flattering attentions which I received from you at Carlton House on Monday, Less was an information of my being at liberty to dedicate any future work to His Royal Highness the Prince Regent, without the necessity of any solicitation on my part. Such at least I believe to be your words, but as I am very anxious to be quite certain of what was intended, I entreat you to have the goodness to inform me how such a permission is to be understood, and whether it is incumbent on me to show my sense of the honour by inscribing the work now in the press to His Royal Highness, I should be equally concerned to appear either presumptuous or ungrateful. The following gracious answer was returned by Mr. Clark, together with a suggestion which must have been received with some surprise. Carlton House, November 16th, 1815 Dear Madam, it is certainly not incumbent on you to dedicate your work now in the press to His Royal Highness, but if you wish to do the Regent that honour, either now or at any future period, I am happy to send you that permission, which need not require any more trouble or solicitation on your part. Your late works, madam, and in particular Mansfield Park, reflect the highest honour on your genius and your principles. In every new work your mind seems to increase its energy and power of discrimination. The regent has read and admired all your publications. Accept my best thanks for the pleasure your volumes have given me. In the perusal of them I felt a great inclination to write and say so. And I also, dear madam, wish to be allowed to ask you to delineate in some future work the habits of life and character and enthusiasm of a clergyman who should pass his time between the metropolis and the country, who should be something like Biddy's minstrel. Silent when glad, affectionate though shy, and in his looks was most demurely sad, and now he laughed aloud, yet none knew why. Neither Goldsmith nor La Fontaine, in his tableau de famille, have in my mind quite delineated an English clergyman, at least of the present day, fond of and entirely engaged in literature, 
no man's enemy but his own. Pray, dear madam, think of these things. Believe me at all times with sincerity and respect, your faithful and obliged servant, J. S. Clark, Librarian. The following letter, written in reply, will show how unequal the author of Pride and Prejudice felt herself to delineating an enthusiastic clergyman of the present day, who should resemble Beatty's minstrel. December 11th Dear Sir, my Emma is now so near publication that I feel it right to assure you of my not having forgotten your kind recommendation of an early copy for Carlton House, and that I have Mr. Murray's promise of its being sent to His Royal Highness under cover to you three days previous to the work being really out. I must make use of this opportunity to thank you, dear sir, for the very high praise bestowed on my other novels. I am too vain to wish to convince you that you have praised them beyond their merits. My greatest anxiety at present is that this fourth work should not disgrace what was good in the others. But on this point I would do myself the justice to declare that, whatever may be my wishes for its success, I am strongly haunted with the idea that to those readers who have preferred Pride and Prejudice, it will appear inferior in wit, and to those who have preferred Mansfield Park, inferior in good sense. Such as it is, however, I hope you will do me the favor of accepting a copy. Mr. Murray will have directions for sending one. I am quite honored by your thinking me capable of drawing such a clergyman as you gave the sketch of in your note of November 16th, but I assure you I am not. The comic part of the character I may be equal to, but not the good, the enthusiastic, the literary. Such a man's conversation must at times be on subjects of science and philosophy, of which I know nothing or at least be occasionally abundant in quotations and allusions, which a woman who, like me, knows only her own mother tongue, and has read little in that, would be totally without the power of giving. A classical education, or at any rate a very extensive acquaintance with English literature, ancient and modern, appears to me quite indispensable for the person who would do any justice to your clergyman and I think I may boast myself to be, with all possible vanity, the most unlearned and uninformed female who ever dared to be an authoress. Believe me, dear sir, your obliged and faithful humble servant, Jane Austen. Mr. Clark, however, was not to be discouraged from proposing another subject. He had recently been appointed chaplain and private English secretary to Prince Leopold, who was then about to be united to the Princess Charlotte, and when he again wrote to express the gracious thanks of the Prince Regent for the copy of Emma, which had been presented, he suggests that an historical romance illustrative of the August House of Coburg would just now be very interesting, and might very properly be dedicated to Prince Leopold. This was much as if Sir William Ross had been set to paint a great battle piece and it is amusing to see with what grave civility she declined a proposal which must have struck her as ludicrous in the following letter. My dear sir, I am honored by the prince's thanks, and very much obliged to yourself for the kind manner in which you mention the work. I have also to acknowledge a formal letter forwarded to me from Hans Place. I assure you I felt very grateful for the friendly tenor of it, and hope my silence will have been considered, as it was truly meant, to proceed only from an unwillingness to tax your time with idle thanks. Under every interesting circumstance which your own talents and literary labors have placed you in, or the favor of the regent bestowed, you have my best wishes. Your recent appointments, I hope, are a step to something still better. In my opinion, the service of a court can hardly be too well paid, for immense must be the sacrifice of time and feeling required by it. You are very kind in your hands as to the sort of composition which might recommend me at present, and I am fully sensible that an historical romance, founded on the house of Saxe-Coburg, might be much more to the purpose of profit and popularity 
than such pictures of domestic life in country villages as I deal in. But I could no more write a romance than an epic poem. I could not sit seriously down to write a serious romance under any other motive than to save my life, and if it were indispensable for me to keep it up, and never relax into laughing at myself or at other people, I am sure I should be hung before I had finished the first chapter. No, I must keep to my own style, and go on in my own way. And though I may never succeed again in that, I am convinced that I should totally fail in any other. I remain, my dear sir, your very much obliged and sincere friend, J. Austin. Charlton, near Alton, April 1st, 1816. Mr. Clark should have recollected the warning of the wise man, force not the course of the river. If you divert it from the channel in which nature taught it to flow, and force it into one arbitrarily cut by yourself, you will lose its grace and beauty. But when his free course is not hindered, he makes sweet music with the enameled stones, giving a gentle kiss to every sedge, he overtaketh in his pilgrimage, and so by many winding nooks he strays with willing sport. All writers of fiction, who have genius strong enough to work out a course of their own, resist every attempt to interfere with its direction. No two writers could be more unlike each other than Jane Austen and Charlotte Bronte, so much so that the latter was unable to understand why the former was admired, and confessed that she herself should hardly like to live with her ladies and gentlemen in their elegant but confined houses. But each writer equally resisted interference with her own natural style of composition. Miss Bronte, in reply to a friendly critic, who had warned her against being too melodramatic, and had ventured to propose Miss Austen's works to her as a study, writes thus. Whenever I do write another book, I think I will have nothing of what you call melodrama. I think so, but I am not sure. I think, too, I will endeavor to follow the counsel which shines out of Miss Austen's mild eyes, to finish more and be more subdued. But neither am I sure of that. When authors write best, or at least when they write most fluently, an influence seems to awaken in them which becomes their master, which will have its way, putting out of view all behests but its own, dictating certain words and insisting on their being used, whether vehement or measured in their nature, new moulding characters, giving a thought of turns of incidents, rejecting carefully elaborated old ideas, and suddenly creating and adopting new ones. Is it not so? And should we try to counteract this influence? Can we indeed counteract it? The playful raillery with which the one parries an attack on her liberty, and the vehement eloquence of the other in pleading the same cause and maintaining the independence of genius, are very characteristic of the minds of the respective writers. The suggestions which Jane received as to the sort of story that she ought to write were, however, an amusement to her, though they were not likely to prove useful. And she has left amongst her papers one entitled Plan of a Novel According to Hints from Various Quarters. The names of some of those advisers are written on the margin of the manuscript opposite to their respective suggestions. Heroine to be the daughter of a clergyman, who after having lived much in the world had retired from it, and settled on a curacy with a very small fortune of his own. The most excellent man that can be imagined, perfect in character, temper, and manner, without the smallest drawback or peculiarity to prevent his being the most delightful companion to his daughter, from one year's end to the other. Heroine faultless in character, beautiful in person, and possessing every possible accomplishment. Book to open with father and daughter conversing in long speeches, elegant language, and a tone of high serious sentiment. The father induced, at his daughter's earnest request, to relate to her the past events of his life. 
narrative to reach through the greater part of the first volume, as besides all the circumstances of his attachment to her mother and their marriage, it will comprehend his going to sea as chaplain to a distinguished naval character about the court, and his going afterwards to court himself, which involved him in many interesting situations, concluding with his opinion of the benefits of tithe being done away with. From this outset the story will proceed, and contain a striking variety of adventures. Father, an exemplary parish priest, and devoted to literature, but heroine and father never above a fortnight in one place, he being driven from his curiosity by the vile arts of some totally unprincipled and heartless young man, desperately in love with the heroine, and pursuing her with unrelenting passion. No sooner settled in one country of Europe, than they are compelled to quit it, and retire to another, always making new acquaintance, and always obliged to leave them. This will, of course, exhibit a wide variety of character. The scene will be forever shifting from one set of people to another, but there will be no mixture, all the good will be unexceptionable in every respect. There will be no foibles or weaknesses but with the wicked, who will be completely depraved and infamous, hardly a resemblance of humanity left in them. Early in her career, the heroine must meet with the hero, all perfection, of course, and only prevented from paying his addresses to her by some excess of refinement. Wherever she goes, somebody falls in love with her, and she receives repeated offers of marriage, which she refers wholly to her father, exceedingly angry that he should not be the first applied to. Often carried away by the anti-hero, by rescued either by her father or the hero. Often reduced to support herself and her father by her talents, and work for her bread. Continually cheated and defrauded of her hire worn down to skeleton, and now and then starved to death. At last, hunted out of civilized society, denied the poor shelter of the humblest cottage, they are compelled to retreat in the Kams Chaktka, where the poor father, quite worn down, finding his end approaching, throws himself on the ground, and after four or five hours of tender advice and parental admonition to his miserable child, expires in a fine burst of literary enthusiasm intermingled with invectives against the holders of tithes. Heroine inconsolable for some time, but afterwards crawls back towards her former country, having at least twenty narrow escapes of falling to the hands of anti-hero, and at last, in the very nick of time, turning a corner to avoid him, runs into the arms of the hero himself, who, having just shaken off the scruples which fettered him before, was at the very moment setting off in pursuit of her. The tenderest and completed eclaircissement takes place, and they are happily united. Throughout the whole work, heroine to be in the most elegant society, and living in high style. Since the first publication of this memoir, Mr. Murray of Albemarle Street has very kindly sent to me copies of the following letters which his father received from Jane Austen when engaged in the publication of Emma. The increasing cordiality of the letters shows that the author felt that her interests were duly cared for, and was glad to find herself in the hands of a publisher whom she could consider as a friend. Her brother had addressed to Mr. Murray a strong complaint of the tardiness of the printer. 23 Hans Place, Thursday, November 23rd, 1815 Sir, my brother's note last Monday has been so fruitless that I am afraid there can be but little chance of my writing to any good effect. But yet I am so very much disappointed and vexed by the delays of the printers that I cannot help begging to know whether there is no hope of their being quickened. Instead of the work being ready by the end of the present month, it will hardly, as written, we now proceed, be finished by the end of the next, 
and as I expect to leave London early in December, it is of consequence that no more time should be lost. Is it likely that the printers will be influenced to greater dispatch and punctuality by knowing that the work is to be dedicated by permission to the Prince Regent? If you can make that circumstance operate, I shall be very glad. My brother returns Waterley with many thanks for the loan of it. We have heard much of Scott's account of Paris. If it be not incompatible with other arrangements, would you favor us with it, supposing you have any set already opened? You may depend upon its being in careful hands. I remain, sir, your obstinate humble servant, J. Austin. Hans Place, December 11th, 1815 Dear Sir, as I find that Emma is advertised for publication as early as Saturday next, I think it best to lose no time in settling all that remains to be settled on this subject, and adopt this method as involving the smallest tax on your time. In the first place, I beg you to understand that I leave the terms on which the trade should be supplied with the work entirely to your judgment, entreating you to be guided in every such arrangement by your own experience of what is most likely to clear off the edition rapidly. I shall be satisfied with whatever you feel to be best. The title page must be Emma, dedicated by permission to his Royal Highness the Prince Regent. And it is my particular wish that one set should be completed and sent to His Royal Highness two or three days before the work is generally public. It should be sent under cover to Reverend J. S. Clark, Librarian, Carlton House. I shall subjoin a list of those persons to whom I must trouble you to forward also a set each when the work is out, all unbound with from the authoress in the first page. I return you with very many thanks, the books you have so obligingly supplied me with. I am very sensible, I assure you, of the attention you have paid to my convenience and amusement. I return also Mansfield Park, as ready for a second edition, I believe, as I can make it. I am in Hans Place to the 16th. From that day inclusive, my direction will be Chawton, Alton, Hans. I remain, dear sir, your faithful humble servant, J. Austin. I wish you would have the goodness to send a line by the bearer, stating the day on which the set will be ready for the Prince Regent. Hans Place, December 11th, 1815 Dear Sir, I am much obliged by yours, and very happy to feel everything arranged to our mutual satisfaction. As to my direction about the title page, it was arising from my ignorance only, and from my having never noticed the proper place for dedication. I thank you for putting me right. Any deviation from what is usually done in such cases is the last thing I should wish for. I feel happy in having a friend to save me from the ill effect of my own blunder. Yours, dear sir, etc., J. Austin. Chawton, April 1st, 1816. Dear Sir, I return you the quarterly review with many thanks. The authoress of Emma has no reason, I think, to complain of her treatment in it, except in the total omission of Mansfield Park. I cannot but be sorry that so clever a man as a reviewer of Emma should consider it as unworthy of being noticed. You will be pleased to hear that I have received the prince's thanks for the handsome copy I sent him of Emma. Whatever he may think of my share of the work, yours seem to have been quite right. In consequence of the late event in Harrietta Street, I must request that if you should at any time have anything to communicate by letter, you will be so good as to write by the post, directing to me, Miss J. Austin, Chawton, near Alton, and that for anything of a larger bulk, you will add to the same direction by Collier's Southampton coach. I remain, dear sir, yours very faithfully, J. Austin. About the same time the following letters passed between the Countess of Morley 
and the writer of Emma. I do not know whether they were personally acquainted with each other, nor in what this interchange of civilities originated. The Countess of Morley to Miss J. Austen Saltram, December twenty seventh, 1815 Madam, I have been most anxiously waiting for an introduction to Emma, and am infinitely obliged to you for your kind recollection of me, which will procure me the pleasure of her acquaintance some day sooner than I should otherwise have had it. I am already become intimate with the Woodhouse family, and feel that they will not amuse and interest me less than the Bennets, Bertrams, Norrises, and all their admirable predecessors. I can give them no higher praise. I am, madam, your much obliged, F. Morley. Miss J. Austen to the Countess of Morley. Madam, accept my thanks for the honor of your note, and for your kind disposition in favor of Emma. In my present state of doubt as to her reception in the world, it is particularly gratifying to me to receive so early an assurance of your ladyship's approbation. It encourages me to depend on the same share of general good opinion which Emma's predecessors have experienced, and to believe that I have not yet, as almost every writer of fancy does sooner or later, overwritten myself. I am, madam, your obliged and faithful servant, J. Austen, December thirty first, 1815. End of chapter 7